All right, Ty. As if the uh, as if the world wasn't crazy enough, I saw something uh, last week that I think will uh, make it even crazier for you. Love. I you love, ready for this? I love craziness. According to Yuga, a YouGov poll. A what? Seven YouGov. I don't know what that is, okay. but it's a poll. Okay. It's out there. It, it's got to be factual. It sounds official. Yeah, they, they use <laughs> you know plenty of numbers for their test That's cases. Right. Yeah, That's right. six people actually were quizzed on this. Seven percent of men think they can beat a grizzly bear in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this. <laughs> in a survey from YouGov, people were asked what wild animals they thought they could successfully win a fight against. <laughs> of the men polled, seven percent believe they could beat a grizzly bear. Nine percent that believe they could beat an elephant. <laughs> 22% they could beat a, said they could beat a chimp, and 23% said they could beat a king cobra. <laughs> what do you think about those stats? Uh, There's a reason ever, women live longer than have men. Have you ever... By the way. There, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> um, have you ever seen an actual bear, like, actually fight another bear? I, I have, and that's why I'm laughing at this. Yeah. Because clearly the people polled were either drunk and, or they've never seen this. And so I've got to think. Or they drive a huge lifted truck with a flat brim hat. <sighs> Do you think there really is legitimately people that think? I, man, it can't I be. I think it's a it joke. It can't be a legitimate. Like, they could not have answered, no. honestly. No There's chance. no way. No chance. There's no way. But you know what, though? we could, You've probably come across these people. I've come across these people, and we all have. Yeah. Is... They just say some outlandish things. And they and in their head, they believe it, though. Yeah. Like, they believe, like, oh, I mean, a bear, we're probably the same size. I'm smarter. Yeah. You might be right. I, I'm I'm going to chalk it up as either, A, they were joking around when they were answering this, or B, they were intoxicated. I would say. I don't think anybody man, looked at I'd, I'd say 3.5% of them were probably dead serious, at least. That's, that's scary. Yeah. If the, I mean, if anything you see in the news is scary, that's one of the scariest. If you think you can beat a grizzly bear in a fight. If you've even seen one video. You know how ridiculous yeah. it is. Yet, yet, we can't get anybody to s stand up and you know volunteer yeah. to be in the military. Well, that's yeah, that's true too. But, well, actually, militaries. Did you see they're dropping a lot of their standards? And the latest one is their body fat percentage. Standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah. So fat yeah. and sloppy, you can be in the military now. Well, look, <laughs> I, I get it, and I think that there's roles that you can be, and maybe it's a good thing because you can get in as long as they're not changing the standards for yes like you can enter in but like changing the standards of okay hey now you've got to get to a certain point mm -hmm. in order to you know pass your basic training go through these things just because again that becomes now you're putting somebody at risk right. if they're going out and having to go to combat and haul um, gear and hike and do all these things like you're putting them at a disadvantage and that's putting lives on the line yeah. so I understand opening it up to let them enroll like great i love that but if it there still has to be a standard from a physical performance standpoint because these are these are the men and women that we rely on to go defend our country right and so at that point i don't know man it's yeah and i have i don't know the whole background i, I did see that report yeah dude i'm all for it because if somebody's like listen i'm I I want to make a life change and let, let's say I started at 40% body fat and then now I'm down to you know the threshold that we can get in like great for, like why should they be excluded yeah if they're doing the right thing that's a very generous take yeah. on why they did it but there. but I think <laughs> but I think what what has to happen though is in that case is there's got to be a, a deeper psychological evaluation I'll let that person yeah. in to see okay what's the likelihood of them continuing on a trend to have a um, have a physical uh, aptitude in order to complete the tasks that they're required to. Yeah, I think, and, and again, I'm open to a mind change, but yeah. I think what happened was they just they're well, just lowering standards. Well, no doubt, no doubt, that's what it is. <laughs> they're seeing the trend of everybody trying, getting bigger. I'm trying, and they're like, I'm trying to apply some empathy <laughs> no, to the no, scenario. We, don't do we, do no, we do no empathy. <laughs> no, 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 no understanding. We just judge everything from, yeah. from this from this microphone without knowing anything. <laughs> yeah, let's just judge from here with just reading the title of the article. That's right. That's yeah, right. I like it. Uh, speaking of that, another thing I saw over the weekend. Have you seen this AI generated song, Drake in the Weekend? Do you know who oh, those, no, do you know so who those two so individuals are? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. Okay. But I didn't see this. So instant. supposedly AI generated a song between a collab between them two, which they didn't do, and the song's now gone viral. Huh. So it's a fake song huh. generated by AI, and it's just taken off. Yeah. Uh, and then also Steve. Well, because I know that, like, 
they'll have like Whitney Houston sing like journey songs. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible what, I mean, it's, a, it's incredible. Right. But like from a copyright perspective, like who, yeah, I don't know who works. owns what? Right. Well, they, did, they, I don't, they also did a Joe Rogan, Steve Jobs podcast, which never happened. And Steve Jobs is not alive anymore. Yeah. And they did a podcast like a two or see, three hours. See, that's, that's scary. Yeah. Yeah. I got an email so what's this your, morning. What's your take on the whole AI? I, man, it's scary. It's scary. I, there are, um, I got an email from a guy I respect a ton. His name's Bob Shank. He does, he has a thing that he started called the master's program that helps helps individuals uh, like go through, find their purpose and identity. And, you know, their faith is a huge part of uh, Your faith is a huge part of it. But um, uh, he sent an article about how there's a number of scientists that have said, hey, we need to hit a six week pause on any more AI development yep. just because it is it is progressing and it is getting out of hand yeah. really quick. I don't want to say we predicted the future, but remember that book we read talked Dude. about that's going to be the end of humanity. Yes, that's it. We're just going to keep progressing and progressing and progressing and, and it'll end us. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was, we were talking to some people this weekend um, that on the farming side of it, like, so we were, Ben and I went to an event, really cool event, Heroes and Horses, um, and met a ton of cool people. I mean, I was kind of in my, like, in my happy place, all these ranchers, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but one, one guy. You fit in well, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> one guy, one guy that we were talking to was just talking about how AI and robotics is going to replace all need for humans on the agriculture and ranching yep. side of it yep which which is scary because you've got got people like bill gates who has the resources and he is the largest now he's the largest private landowner in the united states mm -hmm. now you've got okay don't need people don't have jobs but now a few individuals will use ai technology robotics whatever to control our yeah. Food, sources. food sources and so when a, a few number of people do that that becomes very yeah. very scary yeah and again i'm a dummy with a microphone yeah. but i'm curious how much of this is warranted fear and how much of this is you yeah know, that's just our natural human yeah. inclination right to be yeah. look for threats Worst case right? yeah, yeah I'm, I'm assuming when people you know and you could argue that this was the demise of humanity a, a long ago but you know printing press I'm, I'm i'm assuming a lot of people thought that was going to be the end of humanity mm -hmm and the telephone and yeah. you know, all these technological changes. It's yeah. we, we're fearful of things we don't know. And yeah. so part of me, yes, I'm like, you know, have an ear up to, well, is this going to be the end of, you know, the work? Difference, the the difference part, between all of those is that we could control that. Like it, it yeah. required human input in order to create something. Yeah. This doesn't, that's right. where, that's why this is completely different. I get what you're saying. Like the TV, right. That's totally something new, right? It's, it's the devil in a box, you yeah. know, it's, it's like, it's crazy. But this is something completely different, right? Yeah. This is this is machines starting to learn and think for their for themselves. And it, I, I mean, again, I think there's definitely some overreaction and conspiracy theories. And I'm and I probably lean. I, I would say I'm a middle, but like maybe I like dip my toe into the like yeah the, this is the uh, government control. Yeah, the <laughs> like the over over cautious yeah. side of it. But man, there's there are some things out there that. Yeah that really have me a little bit, a little bit nervous. It'll be a fun ride though. Till that happens. Yeah. I mean, until the, till the bots take over, <laughs> it'll be fun. I'll get to talk to jet chat GPT and he'll, or she Dude, or whatever it is. I've, I've, written, my, I've written my last <laughs> business development email. <laughs> I've never written another one again. Thank you. <laughs> chat GPT. <laughs> so yeah, for the next five years, we'll, uh, we'll have a fun ride and yeah, then yeah. it'll be over. Yeah. And whatever. So we'll worry about that then. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Just worry about the now. Speaking of that Heroes and Horses event, what did you yeah. think, man? That was, man, that was awesome. Yeah, so awesome. Heroes and Horses, if you've been listening any amount of time, we had Micah Fink on. Uh, was it last year? Dude, I think it was last summer. Was it that long ago? I think it was. So anyway, Micah Fink is a former Green Beret. Like or sorry, former Navy SEAL. Don't, yep. they don't say Green Beret. Former Navy SEAL. Uh, and he has started a nonprofit mm -hmm. called Heroes and Horses. It's a 40-day um, wellness retreat yeah. in Montana that he takes veterans. Uh, the numbers he shared over uh, Crazy. Saturday night said up to 44 veterans per day, per day. are committing suicide. Yeah. Uh, was it Duke University that, yeah. he, that Duke he referenced? University. Duke University did a study saying that veteran suicide is underreported up to 33%. Which means you know everyone you know kind of knows the twenty two kill and you know, twenty two veterans take their lives a day, but 
um, because of underreporting, that number could be higher, yeah. as, as high as 44 a day. So, and he was mentioning that he was on like a 10 day tour, different cities, meeting with people and raising support. And uh, he said in that time, he lost three friends that he knew yeah. that took their lives. In the so last 10 days. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's an epidemic in that, um, in that population. And, you know, he, he, man, he's so, he's so intellectually diverse and deep and advanced. Right. And he's just kind of, and, and one of the things he said is like, what can we do to change it? And he said, nothing like we're not doing anything to change it. And he was throwing out some other numbers. He said in the last, what, like there's 500 and 500 or 5,850 nonprofits that serve veterans out there, maybe more. And there's a, there's a combined like $3 trillion that have been, have been contributed to nonprofit. And I'm butchering these numbers. So don't, please don't Google this and look it up. Cause I promise you'll find the point it. Is, point is like yeah. more, more than the hundreds of billions has, have been spent on veterans and there's nothing changes. And, the and, problem's and it, getting worse. It's getting worse. Yeah. And so what can we do? And, and Heroes and Horses is, is they're taking a totally different approach. It's not like giving them resources. It's not this. It's literally changing them from the inside, yeah. getting them to think differently, getting them to realize, okay, what is my purpose outside of serving in the military? You know, what am I passionate about? What can I do? What is my resilience level? Like the things that they're doing, like hot and cold plunges and sweats, and they ride like, what do you say, like 800 miles on yeah. a horse? Well, and you have your own horse, days. and so you got, that's your responsibility. So oh. that the magic's in the lifestyle change. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. length of time that gets you in different, different habits. Yep. And so he shared a couple of people. There's a 32-year-old that's taken, or a 28-year-old that's taken 32 different pills. Yeah, a day. A day. Yeah. And so the idea is that you go there, and you're not taking any medication. Yep. You're just eating meat and vegetables and, and drinking water and coffee mm -hmm. only. Like it's a full cleanse of yeah. all the habits and getting you out. Now the trick is I can do this for 40 days, but yeah. when I reimmerse myself back right. into my everyday life, right. how do you, then what happens? How do you apply that? Right. And, and, you know, yeah. you and I have both done this 75 hard challenge, and I'm not saying that's anything relate, like comparable, but it's like, okay, cool, this like this really cool thing that we think we're going to change our lifestyle and we got the 75-day deadline and we finish it and awesome, great for us. And then it's like back in real life. Yeah. And it's like, okay, how do you how do you implement these things that you've learned and in, into a lifestyle change? And that that again is is what they're trying to do is it's is it's not like, hey, we're gonna take you and we're gonna just change it for 41 days, is we're literally gonna help you think differently. Yeah. And 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 use like use all of the giftings that you have wired into you and pull those out. But it takes, yeah, being out in the wilderness 14 days by yourself is one of the things that they do. So it was really cool, man. And the support there, like Four Sixes is a really famous ranch. Some of those guys were there. And, yeah. man, it was just a cool just to see the support that that, that people have for for this this foundation and, and veterans. Yeah, and, and I would be interested to see. And they haven't been around super long. But I would be interested to see what their reentry program is like and their follow-up and, yeah. and how the guys yeah. are doing, you know, a year after they do the pro – again, they're so young. Yeah. I don't know. I doubt they have that data just yet. But uh -huh. it would be interesting to see. Because, again, you can – like like you made the illusion, it, it can be great for 40 days, and then what do you do when you go back to the reality? That's right. So That's he right. had three friends lost in the last 10 days while he's out, you know, spreading awareness. So yep. it's definitely a problem that's getting worse. But thankfully there's people like him yeah. that are – Trying to improve it, kind of along those lines. I was actually uh, you can get you can get little um, thought bubbles, little um, life lessons, uh, pretty much anywhere. Yeah. I would say um, if you're looking for it. And I was actually reading an ESPN article of all things. What? Yeah, a baseball article. There was actually value brought. There was some value. Wow. Yeah, it's all this. Right. There's this young outfielder for the Arizona Diamondbacks. He's like 22, just signed a big, massive deal. Um, Ram. and, but apparently he's very forward thinking he's, he's be mature beyond his years. And he was a, I forget what major he, Oh, what he's doing. He's taking classes at Arizona state right now, okay. psychology classes and kind of, you know, so he's just signed a hundred million dollar deal, but he's still going to school and he's learning <laughs> and he's trying to, so, but Some there was cool a, there was like an interesting quote. Parents. Yeah, seriously. There's an interesting quote in the article from him. He says, I want to get your, get your feedback on this. So the thing I most identified with is that when you're chasing happiness, you're chasing a feeling, Carol said. You're chasing a state that's temporary. And if everything's always good, then nothing's good. That was a super interesting concept to me of how important those low moments are in creating the, those positives, not getting attached to those waves. 
And at the end of the day, it's more about contentment of life and finding your life to be valuable. Yes. And I thought, I, I, you, you hear some variation of that, you know, yeah. here and there. But I thought that perspective was really interesting of, because you think, I want to be happy all the time. Yeah. But then if you're happy all the time, you cease to, it's just like anything. Yeah. It ceases to be special. Your, it becomes your new baseline. becomes your new baseline. Yeah. And so it's impossible because it's a feeling, it's impossible to feel all the time. Yeah. And in fact, you do need those, that paradox. You do yeah. need the down, yeah. the low times to appreciate the happiness. Yeah. So I thought that was a very mature no, that, like, perspective that's, from that's a 22 a year old of, kid. That's a lot of wisdom. Like yeah. to, to recognize that at that age and, and really, um, it, it, it's, goes to the point that you've brought up quite a bit is okay you you worked your tail off in real estate and you know it took years and years and then you're like all right i've closed a couple big deals and i look at okay i've I, i've made it like i've gotten to where a level that i never thought that i'd get to and i thought that i'd feel very different mm -hmm. and and you don't and it's in professional athletes is the extreme version of that because you have such a such a high amount of of earnings in such a short period of time you should you would think that there's no problems at all mm -hmm. right like you're happy this is the, the this is the peak the problem is 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 their feelings right, right. they're they're temporary mm -hmm. and feelings go away you may be happy for a little while but you recognize very quickly is if everything else is not in line and you're not um, you know, you're not in line with, um, your mission. You're not in line with your purpose. You don't have a foundation of like, okay, Hey, here are my, here are my beliefs, here are my morals, here are my standards. Am I in line with that? And, and feelings, they're great. And, but in emotions, that's fine, mm -hmm. but they are all temporary. Yeah. Those are all temporary things. And so what are you focusing on that is sustainable through your life or eternity based on kind of what you're what your spiritual beliefs are yeah. and, and that's and that's what's important it sounds like he's starting to pursue that yeah yeah so his name's corbin carroll all right, i'm a fan like of his because again that perspective right. is pretty impressive at 22. you know what's crazy though is is embracing the negatives especially in baseball right mm. you're if you're the yeah. best like 70 percent of the time you you suck yeah 70 percent yeah. if you're the best one out right. there right and then and then to say okay hey, handling the negativity and like embracing those and we've we've talked about it right embrace those times that are tough embrace those times that are hard because there's a really good chance that you are learning through something so that you can be more resilient stronger more productive find joy mm -hmm. in the other times and sure. so man that's dude that's wisdom from yeah. a young kid yeah he just uh, sounds like and like you said good good on his parents yeah uh, okay, last week, picking up from last week, we went over, it was part one of our uh, study of the book, Think Again, which I'm convinced is a book that should be mandatory reading mm -hmm. in high schools mm -hmm. all across the country. All right. Uh, basically, the, the premise of the book is just getting you okay with being open to the idea of changing your opinions, um, how do you approach conflict uh, and arguments and things like that, how do you convey mm -hmm. your, your point of views, um, and, and today... We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, we're going to open up a little bit about, he calls it the good fight club. So when you find yourself in an argument, when you find yourself in a conflict, uh, in a disagreement, mm -hmm. how do you go about that? What's the wise way yeah, to go about that? Good. Um, and again, this is something that I wish everybody on Twitter would read right now uh, because this is all great advice. And he opens up, he says, healthy conflict is actually good for you, mm -hmm. which is, uh, again, another kind of a paradoxical statement. So from the book, he says, Although productive disagreement is a critical life skill, it's one that many of us never fully develop. The problem starts early. Parents disagree behind closed doors, fearing that conflict will make children anxious and somehow damage their character. Yet research shows that how often parents argue has no bearing on their children's academic, social, or de emotional development. What matters is how respectfully parents argue, not how frequently. Kids whose parents clash constructively feel more emotionally safe in an elementary school. And over the next few years, they actually demonstrate more helpfulness and compassion towards their classmates. Being able to have a good fight doesn't just make us more civil. It also develops our creative muscles. I thought that was interesting because I, I'm very uncomfortable in conflict. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'll just, I'll just say it straight. I don't like arguments. Yeah. I don't like, you know, disagreement. I'm pretty passive when it comes to those 
type discussions. Usually, I'm I'm fine deferring to. Okay, you're right. That's fine. Let's let's move on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> growing up, it's not something my parents really ever did was yeah. arguing. At least not in front of us. I don't yeah. remember. I rarely. I don't remember any big arguments. Yeah. Um, which again is a good thing. Yeah. But I think his point in the book is it's okay to see disagreement as long as it's healthy disagreement. Right. And you're being respectful of each other. You're listening. Yep. Now, obviously, yelling, knockout, drag outs, that's probably not going to be good for your kids. Yeah. But it was interesting, the line there, it says, studies show that has no bearing on the children's academic, social, emotional development, if done the right way. If, yeah, yeah. And so I just thought that was an interesting perspective of, I've always thought of conflict as it's not a good thing. Yeah. Let's try to avoid it at all costs. And you do want to avoid it. Uh -huh. But done the right way, it actually has healthy yeah. ramifications as yeah, well. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I, I'm I'm wired like you. I would much prefer, I'm sorry, it was my fault. Like, yep. you know, let's move past this. Uh, what I learned through, through, you know, the first half a decade of my marriage was the problem with that was then there would be like bottled up resentment. And there would be things that I had had problems with that I never voiced because I would I would shy away from conflict. Mm -hmm. So then they would just bottle up, and then they would come out of nowhere. Yeah. And then it was an unproductive. Then it was an unproductive conversation at that point. And so I'm like you, and I've gotten better um, in addressing hard conver having hard conversations mm -hmm. earlier on as opposed to later. And like we had this conversation the other day, like talking to other brokers in other markets. Like mm -hmm. there's an uncomfortable conversation you got to have on how you split fees on projects and stuff like that. But like it's necessary to have those things on the front end. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't call those conflict most of the time, but we do face conflict. And, and actually this business has helped me with that. Yes. Helped me become a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. Standing up for myself, being strong. Now, again, there's a, there's a, a balance of ego uh -huh. and, and pride that you, you don't want to be a jerk about it, mm -hmm. but there are, times where you've got to fight a little bit especially for you yeah. know, your clients so. and there's and, and like the right talking about the right way to do it is is what i've learned is is and my wife has learned luckily because she very much is like no right now right mm -hmm. this second we're gonna hash this yeah. out and i suck at that like yeah. because i get emotional and i don't think through things and i say i, I just again d default is just to get past it be done with it but then if like you do stay engaged then it's like then I just don't make sense. Like I, I, for me, I need I need time to process, and everyone's different. Whereas yeah. my wife is like boom, 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 boom. Like hash. make a great attorney, right? Because yeah. she's just like off the cuff. Like makes sense, makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. Remember this, remember that, remember this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I don't have anything. But like I know that like the emotions that that are enacted because of this topic that we're talking about are valid. Like they're valid. Like they're so. Uh, this weekend, uh, something that someone said is uh, your emotions are valid. They just may not be reliable. Mm. So if you are feeling some way, it's called being a human. That that's right. <laughs> that's fine. But but most of us can't process our emotions that fast. And I'm not one of those people. So I need time. So luckily, as as my wife and I have matured in our marriage, it's been okay. Look, I'm not ready yet. Like, I'm not going to let this sit for a day or two days. Like, give me an hour. Give me some time. And typically for me, like, working out's the best thing. Because mm -hmm. then it works. Like, I'll think really, like, intentionally and deeply during that. But then it will come back. And you realize, okay, hey, those emotions that I felt, um, like, previously, like, in the moment, really weren't reliable. They yeah. weren't great, right? It was, it was, um wasn't validated or it was, you know, maybe too far one direction or the other. And now it's like, okay, now I'm going to like assess and now I can have a logical conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really helped us with it. Like my parents growing up, they would argue, they would argue away. And yep. there was, there was usually like yelling. They would always lock their door and they'd go in the room, which I, I respected that they wanted to take that away. Um, but I do remember times where I was like, Oh, there's no way they're staying married after this. Mm. Like, there's no way. Yeah. And then you'd have to have that. Are you guys getting a divorce? Like, we'd have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many parents out there have had that conversation with their kids that are old enough to kind of understand that. Um, but I think what that what that signals is that's probably an unhealthy way of arguing, because if you know a six or eight year old deducts that okay, hey, this may result in them not being married anymore. 
what, how, how much they know about relationships or not, like that's probably okay. Hey, we need to probably address how we're either speaking to each other or the volume that we speak to each other at, whatever that may be, or, Hey, how, how is it? But I do think I got some advice from someone I really respect that like, Oh no, 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 no. We never fight in front of our kids. And I don't think that that's healthy either. I think you do need to show that, listen, we can have a disagreement. We can not see the same about something, but we can reach a middle ground and we can work through that. And that's that creative, that creative function that you're talking about is, is it does, it does enact because it's one, you have to listen when you're emotionally charged. Like that's hard to do because what are you listening for when you're in a com when combat? We talked about this last week is you listen for something that you can use against them. Right. You're not listening to what they're trying to mean by it. But if you are, if you are intentional about, listen, we're going to work through this together and it's hard and it sounds good you know, it's on the microphone with my wife not here and you know in yeah, a good when, place when, right yeah, it's like ah, that's easy calm. to say yeah. but in reality is if you are intentional about being productive in your disagreements i think it's great for kids yeah, to see it's that a great lesson learning lesson yeah, yeah we, we think about a lot of things that we want to pass on to our kids yeah. i rarely if ever think about having a good argument yeah and, sh and displaying good arguments. Yeah. Now, again, big conversations, money, things like that. You probably do want to, there, yeah. there's, there's obviously big conversations yeah. you want to keep behind. Yeah. But I, it's open this, that section opened me the idea of it's okay to have conflict in front right. of my kids. Cause it's going to show them. One, one example is, is I used to just like, if it, if it would start, I'd like pull away and I'd like walk away. Mm -hmm. And what I started seeing and specifically my son is I would see him, if he was either getting disciplined or he had a disagreement with his sister or is he would just uh, and then he just leave right and it's like as a kid on the playground if there is a disagreement a lot of times it's good to be able to just walk away yep but it's not it's not always healthy because sometimes okay hey, we do need to talk through this instead of like and he would go and he would like pout and kind of throw a fit but he would like go by himself and i'm like he sees me kind of do that mm -hmm. like get get so upset that he just leaves and doesn't handle it and just avoids it right uh, next thing he talks about is finding common ground with those that we disagree with. It says from the book, we won't have much luck changing other people's minds if we refuse to change ours. We can demonstrate openness by acknowledging where we agree with our critics and even where we've learned from them. Convincing other people to think again isn't just about making a good argument. It's about establishing that we have the right motives in doing so. When we concede that someone else has made a good point, we signal that we're not preachers, prosecutors, or politicians trying to advance an agenda. We're scientists trying to get to the truth. Yeah. I thought that was really good. And I, I've actually used this, especially lately after reading this book, is the first thing that comes out of my mouth in a disagreement and an argument is acknowledging the person's perspective, acknowledging their argument, and making them feel heard. And I think that goes a long way, setting yourself up on a good foundation yeah. to then bring in your perspective and your side of things. Cause yeah. again, now you're not looking like you're just trying to get something. You're actually showing them. I yeah. heard you. I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Here's my perspective. How do we come to a common ground? Yeah. In, in, in a disagreement or conflict, if you just bully your opinions onto somebody, there's not any kind of heart change on the mm -hmm. other side. There's no, that's actually what we're going to talk about next. That's a great point. There's no adoption, right? So if, if you don't acknowledge what they're saying, then how is how can there be any trust built? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have trust with the other person, whether it's long term or in the moment, because like my wife and I, we could lose trust in each other in the moment. Like we have life lifetime trust for each other, but there's moments where it's like, I don't trust that you're actually listening to me, and I don't trust that you're acknowledging it, and I don't trust that you even hear or think that my my feelings are are valid. Mm -hmm. And so, how do you ever expect? to find a common ground, or if you are trying to change their mind on something is how do you ever expect them to do that if they don't trust you? Right. Yeah. That's actually what he goes in next. You made a great point there. He says, there are times when preaching and prosecuting can make us more persuasive. Research suggests that the effectiveness of these approaches hinges on three key factors, how much people care about the issue, how open they are to our particular argument and how strong willed they are in general. The more the topic matters to them, the more the quality of reasons matter. It's when audiences are skeptical of our view, have a stake in the issue, and tend to be stubborn that piling on justifications is most likely to backfire. If they're resistant to rethinking, more reasons, sim more reasons simply give them more ammunition mm -hmm. to shoot our views down. So what he's saying there is 
you may have all the evidence in the world. You may have yeah. all the facts, all the data mm -hmm. right behind you. If that mm -hmm. person's not open and receptive to it, yeah. giving them more, yeah. being a fire hose of more information yeah. isn't going to persuade That's right. them. right. Yeah. And you know who I, I really feel like in this sector are, are not doing a great job is I, I do feel like the right wing anti-transgender advocates mm -hmm. are not doing a great job of this. Yeah. Um, because you are speaking to a population that f believes something mm -hmm. and, and then all you're doing is condemning them, telling them they don't have answers. They don't have reasons. They don't have logic. They don't have science backing them. They don't have this. They don't have that. And all you're getting on the other side is just more animosity. Like you don't get it. You don't yeah. understand it. You don't, you have no idea. And again, like, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm one side or the other here. Um, what I'm saying is, is I, I do believe there are a number of public figures and activists that are just not doing a great job and acknowledging, look, there's pain, there's hurt, there's all these things that are going on. And if you don't acknowledge that, then it doesn't matter what yeah. you say. You could be, and like, and I, to be honest with you, their most of their points are a thousand percent valid. Right. right. But there, none of it is going to be received. And that's where I get skeptical of the goal. What's the goal? Is you, are you trying to make a good faith argument and you're trying to convince them of your views and, and show them logic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or are you just trying to condemn people and yell and, and yeah. be heard and try to make your name bigger? Yeah. That's where I get skeptical of what are the motives really? Yeah. If, if your goal is to help them see an error in uh -huh. their thinking yeah. or their lifestyle, wherever your goal is, yep. you're clearly not going about it the right way. Mm -hmm. And it seems like common sense, but you're exactly right. Well, so that's what makes me skeptical. It's, of Maybe it's, they don't want them to, to change their mind. Maybe they just want to be loud and bombastic and divisive. And, and divisive. I, I get Maybe it. I get goal. it. And but but uh, yeah, it's hard, right? Yeah. Because it, in one perspective, it's like, okay, it's pretty logical what you're saying. Like it's it makes all the sense in the world what you're saying. So that's like that. But if you take a step back, right now you got a thirty thousand foot view of it. You're like, okay, but like you said, what is your goal? Are you trying? Are you trying to? Uh, what yeah, what are you trying to do? If you're trying to persuade a group of people to I don't begin think they, thinking, I don't the, think that's what I don't they think are. they are. I, I don't think, think they are. I think it is, it is a, I mean. And again, there, there, we're, we're probably like brush over dra yeah, dramatizing it here. Brush. But like, I think it, it's like a war on one versus the other. And we want to extricate you and we want yeah. to make you look as stupid as possible. It's all politics, yeah. right? It's left and right. It's like, I want to make you look as stupid as possible so we get all of the, as many people as we can on our side so we can just eradicate you. And I think in this case, it's it's very similar as opposed to, okay, hold on. Like, do I want to actually change minds or do I just want to make you look as stupid like an and, yeah. and dumb and, you know, unneeded as possible? Yeah. Right. And and do I want to make you look like the enemy? And unfortunately, I feel like it's the latter. I, I, I totally agree with that. I think it is the latter based on evidence. Yeah. It, based on what? Yeah. What, if what you're I've truly had. trying to change people's mind, is yelling at them on Twitter going to do anything? Yeah. Probably not. No. I mean, how many people have changed their mind from being yelled at yeah. on Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine the numbers are very yeah. low. Because again, <laughs> let me be let me be very clear is I do think that there is there is validity and there's science and there's all of these things behind it behind many of their arguments and and there was one that i had seen it was one guy was like I, I we keep asking these questions and we don't get any anything you don't have science to back it you don't have meaning to, you don't have your reasoning behind it you don't have goals behind it. you don't have any of the mm -hmm. answers well it's again there's a number of individuals that are are, are in this you know lbgtq i i and i'm gonna butcher whatever's after that but um, in that space that are really hurt mm -hmm. and and really broken and then they don't feel valid and you got to think that this population before they came out or before they announced or before they whatever is they were already hurt because they felt something inside whether it was valid or not mm -hmm. they felt something inside that they were less than right and they hit it and then finally they announced it and then now they're feeling attacked again. So it's like an unsafe place for them to be. And so like, I hear that and I understand that I'm not saying it's right or that I agree that this should now be pushed on our children or the conversation should be as, as, as loud as it is in our culture. Um, and I, but I do hear that there's hurt and I, and I acknowledge that and I respect that mm -hmm. and the conversation should look different. And I apologize for all of these right wing 
extremists that are that are causing more hurt and division. Yeah. But I also apologize for the extreme lefts that are causing division. I was gonna say, and to, to it's be, not it's yeah. not one side or yeah. the other. It's it's both sides. Yeah, to be charitable, there are some bad faith actors on that side too. <sighs> yeah. Right. And yeah. who knows? We talked about AI earlier. Who knows how many of this is bot generated? Like. And well, it's recently, it's not all yeah, 100%, recently, but this yeah. is this has been a conversation for 20 years yeah. that's been that has been uh, divisive. It's been um, it's been on the extremism yep. spectrum. Like these are things that uh, you know inherently because there's there's so there's so much history that condemns this. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much science that proves it wrong, mm -hmm. um, and then. Also, I would say, even from an empathetic side, there's so much hurt that is caused by these decisions. Yeah. So I think uh, most people that align on the side that like, hey, like I disagree with this movement would say, hey, this isn't good for you. This isn't good for kids. This is, this is, a, this is a path that you're taking that, that only causes pain. Yeah. And we don't want that for you. I think that's a majority, yeah. right, if they, if they oppose it. But, but coming down on them, throwing facts, telling them they're wrong, telling them they're stupid, attacking, preaching, all of that stuff is not not going to resonate with that population. And not to open up Pandora's box, but how many people making... We have seven more minutes, Ben. The, the scientific <laughs> uh, arguments now yeah. are the same people that two years ago were <laughs> anti-science. Oh, it's so funny, man. <laughs> it's so... But again, but again, it's, it's the preaching. You're going to use whatever weapons necessary to right. get whatever yep. point that you're trying to get across when the best tool that you can use is just shutting up and listening mm -hmm. and having a very... Having a compassionate conversation with That's someone. Right. That's right. I'm actually going to give the formula here for how if if everybody making these arguments would just listen to this pull formula. Pull your car over. Right here. Pull your pull your Write notes this down. Put put your pull your notes app, piece of paper, whatever you got. We're, we're about to solve we every argument we in, go. in the history of arguments right here. It says when we point out <laughs> that there are areas where we agree and acknowledge that they have some valid points, we model confident humility and encourage them to follow suit. When we support our argument with a small number of cohesive, compelling reasons, we encourage them to start doubting their own opinion. And when we ask genuine questions, we leave them intrigued to learn more. We don't have to convince them that we're right. We just need to open their minds to the possibility that they might be wrong. Mm -hmm. So there's your formula right there. Here's so, the, here's the thing. This, right. And and I know I always come back to this, but um, the most important person, the most influential person that's ever set foot on earth, um, and it and it can't be argued historically, scientifically, whatever, is Jesus, right? And and then I'll go next, I'll go next level. And then I would probably say Gandhi, Mahabit Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King. Okay. What do all of these people have in common? Love. They approach it with compassion and, and love, right? Is Jesus didn't condemn the prostitute. He didn't condemn the tax collector. He made friends with them. He broke bread with them. He showed them that, hey, listen, your love, regardless, we're all broken. We're all broken in different ways, but you are loved, and your, your sin, bad choices, your shortcomings— we want I, all I want is for you to be free of those. I want we don't want you to have that. Don't want you to have this pain. And same with Gandhi. Same with Martin Luther King. I mean, he, his the the civil rights movement in the U.S. and again in recent history, right? Like there was the most hate, divisiveness. Like, look, we think it's bad right now. Imagine living in those those times. Mm. I mean, that was awful, mm. awful, and. He came at it with love, like mm -hmm. every right to be angry, every right to be aggressive, every right to be violent. And he didn't use that approach. And so, again, it's so funny because we refuse, refuse to learn from our past. We refuse to look at, okay, when movements happen, the most successful movements in the history of this earth, what, was, what, what led it? What charged it? And it's not attacking people. It's not putting them down. It's not doing all that. It's listening. It's 
it's it's serving we talk about all the time mm -hmm. and and that's those are the foundations of okay hey look if you do want a movement you do want people to join the mission that you're on telling them they're an idiot is not going to get them to stand behind you that's not that's not how it works right. and so again it's just it's just so funny to me that we can be so short-sighted and we can forget you know we can forget all of the things through human history that we just jacked up and we just keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating yeah. it and repeating it. Yep. No, I agree. We should have ended it on that, but we've got two more sections. I like, we're it. Go over. I like it. <laughs> uh, Cause I think these are, these are good. To, these are a good way to end it. Uh, first one's motivational in interviewing. Second one's genuine listening. So motivational interviewing. The central premise is that we can rarely motivate someone else to change. We're better off helping them find their own motivation to change. Motivational interviewing starts with an attitude of humility and curiosity. The goal isn't to tell people what to do. It's to help them break out of overconfident cycles and see new possibilities. The process of motivational interviewing involves three key techniques. Asking open-ended questions, engaging in reflective listening, and affirming the person's desire and ability to change. That's what we just said. I mean, getting, giving you the opportunity and not convincing, but giving you the opportunity to see that there is a better way. That's right. And it's, it's all about the intent behind it, right? Yeah. It's, it's, there's no agenda behind it. It's genuine right. compassion, care, no. like exactly what you were no. talking about. And then genuine listening. Uh, we'll, we'll end it on this. It says, listening well is more than a matter of talking less. It's a, it's a set of skills and asking and responding. It starts with showing more interest in other people's interests rather than trying to judge their status to prove our own. Many communicators try to make themselves look smart. Great listeners are more interested in making their audience feel smart. They help people to approach their own views with more humility, doubt, and curiosity. The power of listening doesn't just lie in giving people the space to reflect on their views. It's a display of respect and an expression of care. Listening is a way of offering others our scarcest, most precious gift, our attention. Mm. Once we've demonstrated that we care about them and their goals, they're more willing to listen to us. Yeah. So we've had a number of guests. And I'll, this is putting you on the spot here. Oh. We've had a number of guests, I feel, um, that were just you know great, great motivators, great speakers. Who would you say resembles that last point? Oh best of Gosh. of all the guests that we have go ahead and go through all genuine listening yeah well but like genuinely cares about you and is empathetic and wants to make you feel smart and wants to like really like there is a a genuine like care about you in order to actually gain that trust mm -hmm. so when they do speak which isn't a ton when they do speak it is actually received I'm guessing you're thinking of somebody in particular. I've got one that yeah. like popped into my head immediately. Yeah. There's a couple that, that roll around my mind. Number one, he's more famous and it was through zoom and you weren't, and you actually weren't there. So you didn't get to appreciate this, uh. but Michael Gervais, yeah. he was a lot. Like okay. That. Yeah. Um, very genuine and very, um, very open in his questions. And, and he would ask us questions, yeah. which never happens on right. a podcast. Right. Right. Uh, I also think of your friend, Jer uh, uh, Jamin. 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 Yeah. Jamin's another yeah. one I think about. Yeah. Um, Very much so. He, yeah. 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 Uh, who, I wasn't even thinking of him, but yeah. yeah. Who were you thinking of? I was thinking of Rocky Garza. Oh, yeah. It was yeah, one of the that's very, very, yeah, very, very beginning. If you if you know who Rocky Garza is on this podcast, you've been you're an OG. <laughs> you are an you've OG. You've been with us for, for a long sure. time. Yeah. I just think of like he would ask questions a ton, and he very much like yeah. he was ve he was very concerned with what how we felt and what we thought about certain. Yeah, topics. Didn't he like go through a we almost did like a worksheet. In yeah. That, like, yeah. That episode. Yeah. It very much yeah. was that. Yeah. Like it was like us, like, yeah, it, it was him interviewing us the right. whole time, right. which was wild, which was totally different. Mm -hmm. But I just think of, and just kind of the genuine empathy that he has, I think just overall and, yeah. and acknowledging, you know, certain pains or triggers or whatever you may be going through. But Jamin definitely yeah. was, is one of those. And, and that's, he is a, Jamin Roller, who's the, the pastor of the church that I go to uh, in Plano, Texas, and it just wise beyond years, and he doesn't have to say a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Like he's one of those people that you'll just sit and talk to, and he's and he just sits and he nods a lot, yeah. and he's and he listens a lot, and he he definitely listens more than he speaks. But like that is that is a sign. But he has changed so many people, 
for the positive because one he acknowledges like his shortcomings he acknowledges that like hey i'm along i'm right i'm right along with you i'm not up here on stage telling you how to do it mm -hmm. like everything that he says so he's like the teaching pastor which is kind of the lead pastor right and every single time he announces himself i'm one of the pastors here like it's not like i'm the lead pastor yeah. i'm this and anytime he says like any kind of like uh, challenge or problem or addiction or sin, like he's putting himself into those shoes. So what it does is how much it just di disarms mm -hmm. the audience that you're speaking to, whether it's one, one person or a thousand people mm -hmm. is it disarms it because you show that like, listen, I'm right there with you. And if you want to change minds, you do it together. You don't do it. You don't force somebody into doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not a it's not a new concept that that good listeners make people put people at ease. You you tend to enjoy, you know. It's funny. It's in the, from the, what's the book? How to Win Friends and Influence People. He he shared. Have you read that book? Yeah. So he shares that story where he had a conversation with uh, somebody at a networking event or something, and he said, "I literally asked two questions. They talked the whole time, and apparently they were talking to somebody else about how much they enjoyed me as a person and, and the conversation. <laughs> it's like I didn't do anything. I just asked questions." Yeah. Yeah. And so it is funny how if you get in a conversation with somebody uh -huh. and you are truly interested in what they're saying and you're truly curious about yeah. them, they're going to leave 99 times out of 10 thinking that that was an awesome, because yeah. I, I got to talk the whole time. Yes. Right? You yes. love answering questions about yeah. yourself. You love getting to talk about your family. You love getting to talk about things that uh -huh. you've done. And so if, if you know that, if you can arm yourself with that yeah. when you're going into things, and if you're just a genuinely curious person too, that yeah. helps obviously. Yeah. But if you know that going into these conversations, they're going to go well. Yeah. That's nobody likes to be around the person that talks the whole time or is bragging about uh, what they've done or the past life. It's the people that ask dude. good, genuine questions. Uh -huh. I love, I'm very curious innately about people. Yeah. And so that's always come more natural for me is yeah. to, to be able to ask those questions and, and be genuinely just cause it is, I am genuinely curious about yeah. people. Um, and that served me well on a lot of, a lot of situations yeah. because it's, and again, it's that, this part ego is always something you work on. Yeah. Um, but it does help kind of tame that ego a little 100%. bit. If you go in to saying, I'm just going to ask questions. I'm not yeah. going to try to yeah. sit there and tell them all about me yes. unless, unless they ask, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. We, as, as humans, a, a huge percentage of us, not everybody, I think some people are wired differently, but we every opportunity to talk about ourselves because what what it what I think we want to do is we want to relate to somebody right. or we want to show that we have uh, expertise or we want to show we're we're trying to validate our conversation validate our value there right and that we can add value and yeah and so any conversation somebody will bring something up and you're like oh yeah and all you're doing is waiting to start talking about yourself again and just all you're doing is hanging on to words that like okay it somewhat relates to this so it doesn't sound like I'm totally talking about myself. I mean, we all know those people. Yeah, we all know those people, and it, it, and like like you said, the conversations that you remember are the ones that genuinely are asking about you, mm -hmm. care about you, and it doesn't turn back to them. Right. Like, and I and I struggle with that. Like, I I do. I love asking questions, but like I I'll find myself talking a lot. Yeah, and it's like no. You know, just shut up and listen. Yeah. And the best conversations, even trying to win business, is I don't say how good I am or what value I can bring or right. how I'm better than your current provider or this. Like, if I'm just asking questions, they're like, dude, yeah, let's talk more. Yeah. It's like, and we all know that, but how many calls have you been a part of where you're on a, t you're on a call with a teammate oh and they talk for 29 minutes to 30? Oh and gosh. it's like, you just know this isn't going anywhere. Nowhere. It's, yeah, it's going nowhere because you spent literally the whole time talking. Yeah. That's how you know you've lost in yeah. that situation. Yeah. It should be a conversation. It should be a back and forth. And yeah. that, you know, whether that's in business, whether that's your personal relationships. Yeah. Um, and I'm telling you, asking questions, if you are listening and you are asking questions that relate to what they actually said, people will think you are way smarter than you actually are. Mm -hmm. Like if you go back and say, okay, oh, I'll ask a question about this. Like they're thinking one, they're engaged and they're asking like intelligent questions that relate to things that I've actually asked. All you have to do is listen and actually consume the information that they're providing and then regurgitate it to them in a question form. And they're like, oh my gosh, this guy's a genius. Can't believe you grabbed onto that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, as we wrap up, I think my two biggest takeaways today are the not avoiding conflict necessarily, yeah. you know, approaching it in a healthy way and, and displaying that, especially to my kids, displaying good, healthy com uh, conflict. Yeah. And, and because, again, you can't get better at things if you don't practice. That's right. So that's one of my takeaways. The other one is a genuine curiosity for people yeah. and making sure that I am hearing uh -huh. their perspective before I'm jumping in immediately to tell them mine. Yeah. And literally verbalizing, I hear what you're saying and, and maybe repeating what they're saying uh -huh. before I jump in and try to make my argument. Uh -huh. I think people want to be heard. Yeah. That's, that's pretty well documented. And I think if I can reaffirm that to them, that I heard what you said, mm -hmm. I have empathy for what you said, mm -hmm. even if I disagree with them, at least I'm starting from that foundation of I, I have an understanding of what you're saying. Yeah. And I think if we can start approaching our future conflicts that way, yeah. Again, this is hard to do on Twitter. It's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be very it's hard impossible to, to do. So, on Twitter. so don't even try. <laughs> Just stay off Twitter. Uh, but in your in your in person interactions, because conflicts happens all the time. Yep. And you're gonna be faced with this. I would challenge you. I'm gonna challenge myself to make sure that person knows I've heard I've heard their beef. I've yeah. heard their conflict. I've heard their perspective mm -hmm. before I jump in and try to share mine. That's gonna be hard sure. to do. Yeah. But that's gonna be my challenge to myself. Yeah. That's my takeaway. Those are my two yeah. takeaways. Any any closing thoughts from you? From that segment, yeah, we'll, no, we'll wrap up next week. We'll do we'll do one more segment on this and then wrap it up. Yeah, next no, week. man, I, I I agree with you. Those are those are the takeaways. And just remember, like, what does winning an argument actually gain you? Mm -hmm. Just kind of keep that in perspective as as you're handling a conflict. Is like if you win that argument, like, what do you gain by that? Mm -hmm. So winning an argument is not proving your point. Winning winning a a argument conflict whatever it is is finding a common ground that both people feel like they're heard felt and that their needs are being addressed. That's good. It doesn't matter. Like you may be the one that's completely hurt, but like if you don't if you don't acknowledge that there's some reasoning behind that person hurting you, then you're not going to fully heal from whatever that disagreement was. Yeah. So, yeah. again, winning conflicts is not winning the argument. Yeah. I've heard what you said. I'm not going to try to improve on what you said cuz it was so good. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>